I'm going to ask you to stand out of respect and reverence for the reading of God's word. This is God's word. Chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, the scripture reads, Now, about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Right. Chapter 12. It says, now about spiritual gifts. First of all, what is a gift? It is something that someone gives you. You cannot earn it. Amen? If we could earn a gift, it wouldn't be a gift. It would be wages. It would be something somebody owes you. And God doesn't owe you nothing. Okay, so God gives us gifts. Brothers, he says, I do not want you to be ignorant. Ignorant is the, the implication of the word ignorant is that you don't know. It's a lack of knowledge. It's not stupidity. Okay, so it doesn't mean you're stupid. It means you just don't know. So Paul says, he says, about these spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant. And you know what I've come to find out? In most churches, most people are ignorant of their spiritual gifts. They don't know them. They don't know what they are. They don't even know. They've never heard of them. Verse 2, he says, you know that when you were pagans, when you were lost, before you come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, Somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray by mute idols. I love that, somehow. Does somebody have a different translation? My, I'm using the NIV because it's such an easy, simplified translation. It says, somehow or another, you were influenced and led astray by mute idols. Anybody's translation read different? This is profound. Carried away. Go back to before carried away. What does it say? Does, does the word use the word somehow? Okay. Carried away. Anybody else? What's it, led astray? The word somehow is profound. Anybody got a word in there similar? Because there's no power in a mute idol. They don't exist. There's no God but God Almighty. He's saying so between these, these, these mute idols that really have no saving power, no power whatsoever, somehow you were led astray by that, by the influences of these things. They have no power. They can't talk. They can't save. They're, they're not real. God is a relational God. He said these things don't even exist. And somehow or another you were still led astray by them. Verse 3 says, so therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. Listen, at this time there was no Bible written. There was no Bible written. And so people are saying, well, how do we know if this guy comes and he says he's a, a prophet of God and he's saying this and he's saying, how do we know? Paul says, I'm going to lay down two very simple and basic truths. One. If a person comes and says Jesus is not who they said he, who he said he is, that person is a false teacher, he's a liar, and not to be listened to. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. You don't need to turn there, just listen. He says, dear friends, do not believe every spirit. When a person goes, oh, I got a word from God. Don't believe every spirit. But test the spirit and see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And guess what? They're still coming. Because there's nothing new under the sun. This is how you can recognize the spirit, recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, that is the spirit of God. He says, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. You hear me? Listen. Practical application, folks. Listen. Every spirit. Every person, everything, every newspaper, every book, every pastor, every preacher that says that the Spirit acknowledges that Jesus Christ come in the flesh, he's from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge it is not from God. Amen. Now people say, oh man, we, we Christians are intolerant, and you know what, in a lot of things we are, we don't show any love at all. We're horrible when it comes, we're very judgmental people. But this is one where we have to stand on. Jesus Christ incarnate, God Almighty. The God-man, 100%, God, 100%, man, the God-man with the saving power to be mediator between God and man is Jesus Christ. Without that, we are in trouble, dead in our sins and lost still. Amen. That's something we cannot buckle on, folks, no matter what. He says, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is from God is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard is coming and even now has already come. So, back to verse 3, it says, Therefore I tell you, anyone who is speaking by the Spirit of God 
cannot be speaking by the Spirit of God and say Jesus is a curse. That is a big time strike. One, two, and three, you're out of there. When a person comes preaching to you about anything other than Jesus Christ being the Son of God, crucified, died, and buried, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the saving, the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. When somebody's preaching or teaching something different about the deity of Christ, major red flag. Run out of that church as fast as you can, if it is a church. Verse 4. He said, oh, by, say, by contrast, he says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The scripture teaches you can't come to God until the Holy Spirit draws you unto himself. Okay, and so when the Holy Spirit is a working in you, when God is working in you, you recognize and understand who Jesus is. You cannot say it unless God reveals it to you, is what he's saying. Okay, so if God has revealed it to you, then God's working in you. And if God is working in you, then he's imparted some some spiritual gift to you. Now, this whole passage is on spiritual gifts. People are like, okay, what's this about? Well, I'm going to get to it. Verse 4, there's different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. He says, now, to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good, to one, to one there is given the spirit of message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge. Huh. Wisdom and knowledge, those words sound similar, but they're not. By means of the same spirit, verse 9, to another faith by the same spirit, and another gifts of healing by the same spirit, to another the manifestation of the miraculous powers and to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, and to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still another the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one as he determines. As he determines. Wow, is right. I don't know where to start, so how about verse 4? He says there are different kinds of gifts, okay, gifts given away by God. God determines whom he gives them to and which gift he gives to that person. Um, the same spirit, one spirit. It says there are different kinds of service but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them and all men. You know, I look at um, the different kinds of services, uh, and I think of the different types of denominations that we have. And, and what happens is a lot of people are divided. Oh, they're doing this, and they're doing that, and they do this, and they do that, and we don't do this, and we don't. This passage in the gospel reminds me of when the apostles came to, to Jesus and said, Jesus, we saw those people over there casting out demons and healing people in your name, and we told them stop because they weren't one of us. Lake County Translation folks, Jesus said, what, are you nuts? Seriously? If they're not against us, they're for us. What are you doing? So the church down the street worships different. Are they proclaiming Jesus Christ? Are they proclaiming the gospel of our Lord? This, the, and this is what's happening. Remember, this is a letter to the church in Corinth, and he's unpacking the problems that they're having. Corinth, what's happening with these spiritual gifts is, imagine that, if you will, the different types of worship. Somebody likes the drums, somebody don't. Somebody likes more preaching, somebody likes more music. Somebody likes to stand more, and somebody likes to clap and tambourines, and other people don't like that, whatever. I mean, throw in what you want. Service is two and a half hours long versus just 30 minutes. Oh, you want to find the one, hey, I can get out before the Bears game starts. That's the one I want to go to. You know, those types of things. And all these things were causing division in the church. This is going back to the other chapters where I follow Paul, I follow Peter, I follow uh, uh, Apollos. All of these things, these, these different divisions. And Paul says, listen, one spirit, one God, one church, really. But what the, down the one church, the church of Jesus Christ, that he's the head of, or is he? He's missing in a lot of churches today. They, they're governed by board meetings and votes instead of the spirit. But he says there's different kinds of gifts, the same spirit, different kinds of service, but the same Lord, different kinds of workings, but the same God works all of them in all men for his glory and his honor and not the padding of your pews. God's not interested in the numerical growth of your church unless, the, unless it's the byproduct of healthy growth. 
You hear me? If the church grows, if we're a healthy church, you grow. You do. But you can grow a church and be unhealthy. Verse 7, he says, each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for, holy smokes. <laughs> Verse 7 in the NIV says, common Beneficial. good. Yours says what, Tim? To help each other. Hmm. Nowhere in there says, so that you can puff up with pride. Amen. Nowhere in there says, for your own good. It says, for the common good. What? The common good of the church. This is why those gifts are given to you. It's to use to help edify and build up the church of God. Not this church, but the church of God. He says, you are all the body of Christ. Each one of you has a part in it. There's things I can't do in this church. I'm not musically gifted. God has not given me that talent. That sound room is complicated for me. I can learn it because I'm a good student. I can learn anything that I really want to. I don't want to. Okay, but there's things that, that I'm just naturally good at. Those are God-given talents, spiritual gifts that he's imparted to me. That ought to be where I'm serving for his glory and for his honor. And there's people who have a talent or a gift that God gave them. They have no desire to use it, and I can't wrap my head around that. Frustrating. Amen. And instead of coming and being judgmental and saying, man, you need to get off your tail and serve the Lord, I would never take that approach because that is not a loving approach. I want to encourage you to the best of my ability, come on, walk alongside you and help you serve the Lord. Never to, to, to badger you or, or guilt you into serving. I just don't understand how it doesn't flow from your heart like it does mine. I'm here on two hours of sleep on Sunday mornings, sometimes no sleep. And I'm not complaining. I do it in a minute. And there's people who can't get here on five hours of sleep, ten hours of sleep. I don't understand that. And not that service, you know, being in church is where it's at, that I have to measure your love for God that way. That's not what I'm saying. But it's a labor of love. When you love what you do, you don't work a day in your life. He says, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. Not himself, others. Faithfully administering God's grace in various forms. You know what ministry is? I ask people, define ministry. They look at me like, oh, ministry, you're administering God's grace to people in various forms, through music, through preaching, through teaching, through encouragement, through acts of service. That's what you're doing. That's what ministry is. He says, each one, that's what he says, offer hospitality without grumbling, love each other deeply, pray for one another. He says, and each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in various forms. If anyone speaks, listen to this, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. Folks, when I preach from this Bible, I'm telling you, I'm telling you I believe it. I know that this is God's word, and I pray that he uses me to communicate his message. There's nothing that I can tell you that he hasn't already said. He just chooses to reiterate through me. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength that God provides. There's people serving in the church, and on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being a dynamic servant, they are fully capable of being a 9, maybe an 8. Maybe they'll never be a 10, but maybe they're, they're functioning, they're at an 8, they're, they're the very best they can be, they're an 8, and they're functioning at a 4, and they're totally fine with it. That 4, if he's at a 4 and he doesn't know any better, and he has the potential to develop to an 8, we should develop him to an 8. There's some people that function at a 10 all the time because they've been gifted to do so. Okay, but all of us can develop that servant's heart. In fact, it is one of the things in our covenant that you said you would do if you signed one that you would develop a servant's heart. He says, anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength that God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ and to him be the glory and the power forever and ever. That's why we're here, folks. I don't know why. You're, maybe you're here for the wrong reasons. Maybe you're here for different reasons. But the reality is we're here to build the kingdom of God. And you do that through the local body, the local church that you belong to. And you do that by using the gifts that God has imparted to you. It is such a simple concept. Chapter 12, all this division of the tongues and all this division of the, the, the gifts that were happening in Corinth are still happening today. The truth of the matter is that everybody's role is important. The toenails, the fingernails, the toes, the nose hairs, those things in the physical body that are important, they're absolutely just as important in the body of Christ. Somebody, somebody has to get the leaves up in the back. Somebody has to cut the grass. 
Should we hire a professional landscaper for that? I don't know. You tell me. Somebody's got to sweep and mop. Somebody's got to throw out the garbage bags. Somebody's got to wash those dishes downstairs in the fellowship when we're done. Somebody's got to do it. Do we hire somebody? Or does God give people gifts? People who have a gift. I love to wash dishes, folks. I know that sounds crazy, but it's something that I don't mind doing all day. So, I mean, there's somebody here, maybe you, gotta, maybe you love kids, man. You need help. With, you see all them kids that walked out of here at the beginning of service? Lord have mercy. I'm glad those people back there got the gift of, of, in a heart for these children. Or they'd be in here. It was, don't bother me none because I don't, you could blow the roof off the place. I wouldn't hear it. But it would bother you. Folks, I'm telling you, God has given you a gift. If you don't know what it is, let me know. I can help you discover it. And then we can plug you in to use it. But we need to use it to glorify God, not ourselves. It's not about us. The day it becomes about us, I pray God will shut us down. <laughs> Blow out the light stand, just like he says in Revelation. Snuff it out, because we're not living for his glory any longer. If you say Jesus is Lord, then you have the spirit working in you. And if you have the spirit in you, you have a spiritual gift. If you have a spiritual gift, do you know what it is? Are you using it? If not, why not? It's that simple. One is not more important than the other. People say throwing out garbage is not nearly a gift. Yes, it is. Because there's some people who will grumble while they're doing it. Other people will whistle. I toss garbage all day long. Here's my upbringing and all the knocks on my head from my mother. I don't know. But I do it with a grateful heart. Grateful. Serving the Lord is a privilege, folks. It is. I think of the privilege we take for granted. One of them is me standing right here on my two feet. There's people who can't stand up or walk up these stairs. I don't know how many times I've did that today. Or to be able to flip on a light switch and see because I have eyesight. There's people who don't even bother turning on the lights because they can't see or they can't hear. Their hands are they're crippled and they can't do what you can do. The things you take for granted. You know, serving the Lord, whatever, the, whatever you do, whether it's in word or deed, do it for the glory of God. God has given you abilities. You say, well, I can't do much. You can do something. I guarantee you could do something. You know, and I'm not trying to guilt you, folks. I'm not. All I'm saying is, if you have a desire to serve, but you think you don't have a gift, you're wrong. There's a place for you to serve. And like, like I like to say, and I said it a million times, and I'll close with this. If you're not serving, you need to get in where you fit in. And if you're serving just for the sake of keeping me off your back, you're serving for the wrong reasons. Let's pray. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, with grateful hearts. Father, I thank you for this day that you've given us, Lord. I thank you for your love, mercy, your grace, oh God. Father, you're an awesome God. You're perfect in every way. Lord, you give us so much, Lord. You give us so much. Not only do you pour out your grace on us, Lord, but you also give us mercy. Father, you impart wisdom to those who ask for it, Lord. Forgiveness. Father, you're just a great God. And we're so grateful, Lord, to stand in your, in your presence, Lord, and being able to do so because of the sacrifice that Jesus has made for us. Father, what a privilege it is to do so. Father, my prayer this morning is this, that nobody here would leave here, Lord, without seriously considering in their heart, are they loving you and living for you and serving you to the best of their abilities? Father, my prayer is just that. Lord, we can build your kingdom. I'm confident of that, Lord. All it takes is a commitment to you, Lord, and a love that is just a fraction of how you love us. Twelve mere men turned the world upside down, Lord, because they had a fire in their heart to proclaim your truth. Certainly we can do it with the church this size. My prayer is that we would. My prayer, Father, is that you'd use us, Lord. Despite our weaknesses, our imperfections, Lord, help us to love each other more and to love you even greater. Give us a desire, Lord, to do your kingdom's work, to build your kingdom and not our own. Help us, Lord, to discover our spiritual gifts, Lord, and I pray, Father, that you light a fire in our hearts that just will not burn out. And it just will not be satisfied until we're serving in a capacity that you've called us to, that you've gifted us to. And so, Father, I pray, even now, Lord, that your spirit would move about this place, touch each and every one that's here this morning within the sound of my voice. Father, as we sing to you, Lord, during our response time, my prayer is that your spirit would have its way with each and every one that is here. Father, we praise you and thank you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>